So I'm going to talk about pet parasite prevention today. Um, and I've slightly tweaked the original title, sorry about that, but I've adjusted it to what people wanted to hear in one of the last talks. And um, the reason I'm talking to you is because I feel that you're an audience that understands or is likely to understand the risk um, for biodiversity for all sorts of, sorts of wild animals. So I hope to find allies, allies in a slightly different approach. Um, the probably best known troublemaker are the neonicotinoids. Um, they've been in the news quite a bit for um, sugar beet. And unfortunately, they're uh, being used again. They have been banned in the EU for agricultural use 2018 um, because imidacloprid is highly toxic to bees. It is available in pet shops and at the vets to treat fleas. Um, products such as Advantage, Advocate, they are spot-ons. So you just put a drop on the animal. And then there are many other brand names. The Ceresto collar contains that as well. So you can use it on cats, dogs, rabbits, you name it. Um, and there's absolutely no regulations for it. But it's not just that class of drugs that's a big problem. Um, it has been held responsible for the mass mortalities of honeybees, mostly in France. But at the same time, fipronil was introduced. Um, and there is very, very strong concern that the only reason fipronil didn't get exactly the same bad press is that the, the assays to assess the damage um, aren't good enough, um, which is how fipronil got its um, approval. So there's actually there are recent papers that we really question and that say there are better ways of testing it now and they show that fipronil is about as bad. Um, and fipronil you get as spot-ons, again sort of a drop you put on the animal or as sprays, the most um, popular one or the most um, well-known one is probably frontline. I see a lot of one called itch out there now. To give you a context, this stuff is 7,000 times more toxic than DDT. One spot on treatment for a medium sized dog contains enough pesticide to kill 60 million bees. So um, it is serious stuff. There are other drugs now, um, but I think the main difference is we don't know much about them yet, um, including tablets. And the scary thing is you can find those treatments in the urine and, and on the hair, not only of treated, but also of untreated dogs. So there's clearly spreading between dogs. It has been found in nests of blue tits, probably due to dog hair being used as nesting material. It's also been found in dead chicks, but it hasn't been proven that there's a link. So, but it's definitely been found in nests and in dead ch in chicks, but they haven't been killed. So we don't know whether there's a direct correlation. Um, even products given orally as tablets result in marked contamination of water that dogs swim in. That was a paper from 2022. The big worry around here, and this is the picture of the River Wye, um, are our rivers and our wetlands. And when it comes to fipronil and imidacloprid, um, there's a really good paper that used data from the Environment Agency and was produced at the University of Essex. For 20 rivers, 2016 to 18, and in 99% of the samples, um, there was fipronil at several times, the chronic toxicity level. 
So um, most of the samples contained too much, which is really shocking. And imidacloprid was only um, too high in seven out of 20 sites, but it is the one that is the proven bee killer. Um, and it will affect water insects really badly. So chronic risk portions indicate a high envir environmental risk for aquatic ecosystems from fiproles and a moderate risk from imidacloprid. That's what the paper concluded. Fucking asshole, you can't actually work out that it said link with Zoom. Sorry? Somebody needs to mute the microphone. Okay. So what about the other anti-parasiticides? Um, there is a paper out there that quotes the six most used ones in the UK. And we have already spoken about imidacloprid and fipronil. Those are the two that are mentioned in that paper. And then we got fluoralanear, so not even the vet can pronounce them. So there's quite a few different ones that get used a lot. Yeah. And the paper concludes, we don't know much about them. Little to no evidence exists for the ecotoxicity of the remaining four parasiticides. Despite heavy usage, there is currently insufficient evidence to understand the environmental risk. And that's a paper from last year. So what I'm dealing with now when I give out stuff is one pill or spot on that works for three months, but that also results in three months of toxic feces. So you may have come across Provecto. It's probably the best liked one at, at most veterinary practices now. It's a prescription only one. Pluralana is the active ingredient. It is absorbed into the body. It accumulates in plasma, those in the blood. It has a really long half-life. And over three months, or a bit longer actually, 90% are excreted in the feces, feces. And we're talking about 90% unchanged toxic stuff. Yeah, it comes out the way you put it in. And it's really persistent in the soil. The feces is likely to cause toxicity in feeding insects, but there are no studies. There's no ecotoxicity data for Bravacto. There is one product against rat mite and chicken, and that is considered toxic, strange. Um, again, I used a paper for this data. Um, you will find it in quite a bit of it in the leaflet as well. If you have it at home, you will have been given it in a package. So if you wanna check on it, you can find that on the leaflet. So the question is big pharma versus biodiversity. The ones we know are a huge problem in the rivers, you can even buy at pet shops and on in internet sites. And you can get them posted as subscriptions monthly. And some of them you can even get in supermarkets without any qualified staff. With the vets, it's a really tricky one. There's a really strong organization that appears scientific, but you just have to go on their webpage. They're simply industry sponsored. Um, the problem is most of my colleagues don't know that and they get very, very upset when you mention it. Um, they recommend for worm prevention between one and 12 treatments a year, depending on, on the risk, but they class 68% of cats and 97% of dogs as in the highest risk category with none considered low risk. So, and same for fleas actually, you're meant to just treat them all the time. Um, and they come to the practices, they, they, they are very present in, in the sort of stuff you get on through the, um, get to read. And they sound as if they were independent. And that's what really makes it tricky. You sort of get that trickle of information that is in the industry sponsored. Um, and obviously it's attractive to sell the stuff as well. 
there is the BVA as a the British Veterinary Association, and they are try they are starting to get critical about it. They are they are mentioning the problem. Um, what the paper has shown and what they relate to is that um, the flea treatments and other parasites reach the rivers through wastewater from homes. And unfortunately, we all know the wastewater treatment in the UK does not work. Yeah. So um, even if you could get it out of it, it just doesn't happen half the time. Um, so it, in the paper, it was very clear that just downstream from wastewater um, treatment plants, you had really high um, amounts of those chemicals in the water. So the theory is it comes from dogs being washed. Um, it gets excreted in urine and feces, and that, that way it gets into gardens and open spaces and absorbed into the soil. It is harmful to a wide range of invertebrates. This could be highly detrimental to wildlife and ecosystems. And this is things that actually vets say, and I'm really gl gl glad to read that other vets are worried about it as well. Um, there's worries about resistances that need preventing, which is a bit, big thing um, with our livestock and with horses. It hasn't really become a major problem with the pets yet, but we need to keep an eye on it. And they consider it a one health problem of immense complexity. They go into um, explaining a bit about parasites, with, which I thought might be interesting. Um, so you've got the external or ectoparasites, which include fleas, ticks, and mites. And you've got the internal or endoparasites, like tapeworm, roundworm, and protozoa, protozoa being the single cell ones, the tiny ones. Um, and this veterinary organization recommends a proportionate and targeted approach. Um, they recommend to risk assess the use of parasiticides for individual animals. Um, and they discourage blanket treatment policies and practices and would like to see research that on the balance of harm and benefits. And one of the tips I really liked was consider not using prophylactic parasiticide treatment at all. Instead, um, monitor. Um, for fleas, you can use a flea comb. I'll talk a bit more about that later. For ticks, um, you can just check them after walks or use a tick hook. Touchwood, where I mostly work, there aren't that many ticks. Ticks are a tricky one, I would say. Um, but also with the ticks, treat with parasiticides if they are seen to prevent an infestation building up. Yeah, so just don't just do it all the time. Act on a problem. If you're worried about fleas, um, they can be a huge problem in the house. You can get flea traps and you can use them to monitor for fleas in the home. Um, they're completely pointless to try and clear an infestation. Um, they are really there for you to spot a problem before your animal is too itchy <laughs> and before it's too difficult to get under control. Um, and you sort of set them once a week to keep an eye on things. The trouble is they do catch other insects as well. So um, yeah, they're not completely without backdrops. Um, and another one that's really a good advice is hot wash pet bedding weekly. Um, 60 degree kills fleas. It also kills dust mites if an animal, an animal is allergic. So it's simply a good idea. Use a non-bio non detergent because the bio ones can cause allergies. And they are even something like, with the deter, um, dogs will really appreciate if you go for something like soap nuts or things like that because they don't smell so much. So, um, and regularly vacuum clean the areas where the pets lie. 
And the other recommendation I personally find really important is that we should be doing more testing, such as fecal egg counts or the, the wet paper test, they call it, um, which is for flea dirt, um, as part of a risk-based approach. So you comb your animal, you use a moist bit of kitchen towel, the kitchen paper, to get the hair off the comb. You leave it for a few minutes and it takes some time. I've, I've had people walk out of the practice and I saw the red um, spots when they had left. So it's really hard to tell whether it's just a tiny bit of dirt or it's flea dirt. But if you leave it on something moist, white for probably three, four minutes, um, it turns impressively red because of the blood in the feces. So it's really easy then to make the, to, to, and, and really cheap to find out at home. Obviously I'm a vet and I don't like to see flea bitten animals. Um, and there's a lot of talk about zoonotic risk and things like that. So what about pets and their families? Um, I would say the benefit of treating affected animals outweighs the environmental harm caused by the use of the parasiticide. So you can't expect a dog, a cat, and a family to be itching. I mean, that's just asking too much. But, and the treatment needs to be matched to the life cycle of the parasite and stop afterwards. Um, side effects for the animal and the family need looking at. It's not just the rivers that are suffering. I personally think putting the same chemical on an animal again and again and again, and before it stops working really well, you get a buildup in the system. Um, so if I had a situation where I felt um, I needed to use something pretty ongoing, I would wanna be using different things. And that's just not what gets done from a point of view of the animal and the family. The stuff is toxic for people as well to degrees. Um, and what I really want to, what, what I'd like to see much less is the prophylactically treating an entire population of healthy animals because that causes environmental harm. And I'd like to say it's not good for, for the family members, it's not good for the animal itself. In high risk situations, you need to use the right product, I would say, and you need to cover the risks encountered for the correct time. So I think making the right choices requires skillful advice and a sales situation doesn't help. With regards to local, um, I've been testing for gastrointestinal worms in my clientele. Um, for quite a while now. And um, the advocate, which is the one that contains the one that is bad for the bees, that gets sold at veterinary practices, um, very heavily advertises because of the dangerous lungworm. And it's a specific lungworm, it's Angiostrongulus. And I have not had a single sample positive with that one. I do, when I go on holiday to South Wales and take my dog, I do always test her after because there is considerably more of that in, at the coast, Southwest Wales. There seem to be some cases around Worcester, but none of my clients has ever shown one of them. Um, I think the map you can find that is sort of pushed very harshly by the people who make the stuff that's meant to treat it, um, I think that contains a lot of the asymptomatic fox lungworm. And we do get that. And if you're unlucky, your dog coughs a bit from it, you use a treatment and it, your dog's fine, you know? So I get quite a few samples back with a positive fox lungworm. Um, people then usually treat, and I think that's okay. I had one client who used to say whenever she treats her dog, she, the dog stops coughing. Um, both the fox lungworm and the um, lungworm everyone talks about requires the dog actually eating snails. So that's the other thing. Does your dog eat snails or do snails crawl across the food of your dog? 
So that's one big selling point for the neo nicotinids. Um, I see quite a few strong guile, strong what well, strong guiles, and they do carry a zoonotic risk, especially for children. It's a bigger problem in young animals, and they are really easy to find in fecal samples. You even just one sample, you will find strong guiles. With the tapeworms, um, I see quite a few and they are said to be really tricky to find. I like the samples to be pooled. I like the samples to be from three days worth of poo. Um, and I, I get to see tapeworms, so, and then you can treat them. But then my clientele commonly hasn't treated in years and feeds raw. So I should get to see the really thick end and most of the samples I get, get back are negative. As I said, mentioned before, there's fortunately not that many ticks in the area. There's the odd spot where that is a problem. And I haven't found a really good answer to that one, I have to admit. Fleas are the biggest problem and it's really difficult to convince affected households to re react with appropriate measures. And we got both ends. We get the ones that you can't get them to treat them effect effectively and the poor animal itches for years or the, or the family gets bitten as well. And then on the other hand, a lot of people who once had a flea problem will be treating religiously every month or every three months from then on because they had that problem. Um, so I think that there should be a healthy halfway, do it properly, but then trust that you can manage it afterwards. Um, yeah, so as I said, my background is mostly from Herefordshire. I also see clients in Gloucestershire and Monmouthshire and do the odd locum job a bit further afield. Um, and it's easier for me to sort of be a bit critical of how it usually gets work because I mostly do holistic referral work now. So I mostly see people for acupuncture, for herbs, for things like that. Um, and I have the time to discuss with them. Well, do you go into the woods? Have you ever seen a tick on your animal? You know, you can have those conversations very differently. Do you have children? You know, it takes time to sort of get the whole picture. I mean, you get bee beekeepers using this toxic stuff on their animals without ha ever having given it a thought. And they run around the beehives. So it's, I think we really need to start thinking about those things and being aware that what we're using is very toxic. Um, on the other hand, with all my love for herbs, I haven't found anything that really works. And if something works, it's toxic. Um, what I want to question is, do we really want to prevent? If I, as a holistic practitioner, claim to prevent something, my, my um, professional body will actually do me for something will do me for it. It's not allowed to say that. But it's the go-to for parasites. Um, I do fully admit flea infestations can go unnoticed and get out of control. But you can really do this test at home. The stuff you need for it is going to probably cost you a couple of quid. Um, just comb the pet, put the hair onto the wet white tissue, and the flea dirt is so much easier to find than the fleas. And as mentioned before, you can use a flea lamp to de detect the problem in the house. That's for the really worried people who want to monitor things. Um, and the house is the problem. During infestations, the fleas breed in bedding and carpets. And that's where you really need to get on top of it. Um, I dare say most preventative measures are unnecessary. But if you do have a flea infestation, you really need to need an effective treatment for three months. Um, I'd like to cover worms as well. Um, fecal sample, the, the products used, they have an overlap and there's a lot of products that treat more than one thing. And I think to make a good decision what you use, you need to know where your problems are. Um, with worms, you use fecal samples to help detect them. I'm, uh, the three-day pooled sample are standard for larval worm, and I strongly advocated for tapeworm, but that's not commonly done. What you commonly get told is you can't test for tapeworm. I dare say if you do a few days pooled, you get pretty good results on that as well. 
Um, raw food is very popular and I'm perfectly, that's fine, but you need to freeze it for two weeks to kill worms. And that isn't routinely done. Believe me, if you buy raw food in a shop, it's gone in there, just about frozen. So um, if you can keep it in your freezer for two weeks, that's a really good idea. Um, young animals are at the highest risk and breeding commonly passes on parasites, but it's usually the round ones and they are really easy to find. Um, that's on my webpage, you can have a look at the parasite check bit. Um, and as much as I would like to offer you a solution, natural wormers are either not effective or they have strong side effects. So if you have an actual worm infestation, a targeted wormer is the best solution. You wanna know whether it's a round worm or it's a tapeworm and you only have to treat the one, one or the other, um, I think in my results, I never had an animal with both in it. Um, there's some really exotic ones you occasionally get, but they are actually not difficult to treat. So you just need to really know, you need to know the cycle. And that's where I think it's a good idea to have a vet and discuss it with a vet that is prepared to really look into it. Um, and I'm in the position, I'm not selling the wormer, so I can be really sort of honest. It's obviously a bit more tricky if you're selling the stuff as well. I would like to, your help. I would like your help to stop the blanket approach that is the absolute go-to in all pet shops and in most veterinary practices. Um, please start, consider starting with your own pets and talk to friends. If you are interested, we can offer how to check for flea workshops, let's say 10 or 20 participants. And um, when with my clients, if they, if they go for the holistic pet club, I always include free flea checks. Um, discuss the topic with your vet or with your pet shop. And when it comes to vets, there's actually a really interesting, um, they are gonna be discuss discussing it on, in one of the next big CPDs. So I think raising the, telling your vet that you're worried for the environment and for maybe for your family's health and um, trying to get a conversation going is a good idea. And it's, it's such a broad spectrum that's affected. We know that pollinators are in decline it's been proven that birds get exposed to the stuff, aquatic life, I mean, with those amounts of those chemicals in the rivers, provenly by the environment, by the envi environment agency. So it's not that I made it up. Um, so the aquatic life is at risk. And honestly, I mean, family members with a fipronil, we know that it, um, affects your serotonin level, levels. It's proven for mice and it stays in dogs and in people for longer than it does in mice. So are we causing depression by getting too much flea treatment exposure? It, it's a really tricky one. It's such a broad subject. Um, so by all means, if you really have to treat something, okay, but please don't use, use it unnecessarily. Yeah, so I may have been a bit quick. Do you have questions on specific topics? Is there something you'd like me to go into a bit deeper? No, thank you very much. That was a brilliant talk and uh, really interesting. I don't have pets. I just have wild animals running around everywhere here. But um, I'm very conscious of the fact that we've lost a very large amount of our insect life and our bird life over the last 30 years. Uh, a lot of it is not attributed to uh, specific causes, it's just a, a, a very sharp decline. So it's very interesting to hear that these products are being sold and a lot of them haven't been properly tested. I'm absolutely shocked to find that is the case. And I don't understand why your profession isn't monitoring it much more closely. Um, is that just down to your profession or is it a government agency issue? 
it's a government agent issue. Um, you should have, when, um, if it was for sheep, you'd have to prove it. Yeah, so the problem is, there was a time where you wormed a dog very occasionally when you saw a problem. Then there was a, dog, a time where you wormed a dog twice a year. If you're not worming the dog once a, once a month, yeah, or using a flea treatment once a month or every three months and it lasts three months, the volume has gone up to an amount that we wouldn't really need that testing. Yeah, but there's no regulation for it. Um, and of course, it's easier for the vet just to make sure the animal isn't itching and not think about it too much. They, I mean, we get told, oh, the tablet is no trouble at all. You know, it's so much safer than the spot-ons. No one speaks about the fact that it's gonna stay in the soil for God knows how long. Yeah, so we get very, we get the information from the people who sell it, which is a massive problem. Yeah, so yeah, regulation is a massive issue. Um, and there's just no, and, there are risks with parasites and there was a time where, and I mean, I've been to India and it, it's, it's hor horrible to see fleas everywhere and things like that. But I think we are in a situation where we should be able to, we have hygiene, we can wash the stuff, you know, we can, we can deal with it when we have an infestation. I, I think just covering all the time is, there's no proportion. Julian Selman, would you like to unmute yourself? You have a question. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I I would echo what you said um, about about the talk. It's it's absolutely um, you know very enlightening and absolutely horrific. And my main thought is we just can't carry on like this, particularly um, as uh, dog ownership particularly has increased to to the scale that it has. I'm not a, I'm a dog lover, by the way. <laughs> I do like dogs. Um, and don't forget the cats. I mean, yeah, and the cats as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. I have a cat. <laughs> um, <laughs> but but um, it strikes me that um, you know I, I'm on a parish council, and um, we've managed to, to almost completely eliminate the use of um, herbicides and pesticides. And yet, this is an unspoken problem, isn't it? And I, I'm very grateful to you for highlighting the scale of it. I knew about some of it, such as the. The, you know the, the the effect of dogs uh, in in ponds particularly, but I didn't know the full full extent of it. And whilst we do need urgently, obviously regulation and law changes, just as we've had with um, these other chemicals that we've inflicted on the on the natural world. I think in the meantime, what you've the powerful thing that you've really um, intimated is what we need is culture change. Um, we need exactly. culture change amongst the vets, vet community and the professionals. We need it in uh, also in dog owners themselves in education. And I've I've struggled with that because when I've raised the issue locally uh, on our uh, council land, which we're rewilding, for example, could dog owners keep their uh, animals on uh, leads during the bird nesting season? Uh, could they stop them going in the rivers uh, and the ponds? Generally, I would say the, the reaction is, is pretty hostile. So I'm very interested in how can we make this process a, a more positive one, get people on board, get them educated about the issues and uh, gradually change the way that we think about our pets, our management of the pets and um, you know what what vets offer obviously is going to be crucial in that process anyway i better stop there but thanks very much you've got my brain really spinning now thank you yeah and and i think i think um telling the dog owners what they need to be aware of for their dogs that the stuff goes in their blood that it goes in the poo that it's toxic for the whole time of the treatment you give one pill and you have three months of toxic poop yeah how are you going to pick up the poop if your dog's running loose yeah. Yes, quite. <laughs> um, I, I know the practical implications. I don't do it very often, but if I go to the continent, I will use a short acting one that goes in the poop. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, and it's in my garden. Oh, <laughs> I need to pick up the poop. You know what I mean? It's, it's a, it's, it's, and, and it's, it, it's, it's tricky for the people who have contact with the animals. The chemicals, they go not, they don't just go from dog to dog, they go from dog to owner. You're exposing, 
And the ones that don't go unchanged into the poop, they go through the liver. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they stress your detox systems. Yeah. So it's, I think it's making clear that, yes, it clearly harms water insects, but it also harms birds, it harms your family, and it may well harm your pet. Probably the pet most, you know what I mean. So, um, and it, it's low level stuff. It's not then only a few of them get really serious side effects, but the more often you use it, the more buildup you get. And Can I just much. jump in? Can I just yeah. jump in for a moment? Um, just to say that um, before we ask the next, next question, um, Echo Morgan wants to know whether there'll be a copy of the presentation. And in fact, it will be um, put up on the Wildlife Trust YouTube channel. So if you want to, uh, you have to wait a day or two and it should go up. So just check that out and you'll be able to see a recording of this. Um, that's just to for your information. OK, thank you. I'll get stand back now. Yeah, that was another advert. and. Uh... It's really helpful to have these recordings because um, you don't have to take so many notes. We've got a question from Catherine Westcott. Would you like to unmute yourself and go ahead, Catherine? You're unmuted, but we still can't hear you. Um. Uh, we might have a technical issue here with uh, Catherine. Sorry, mic not working. Okay. Well, um, Iris, can the... I just ask you, can you stop sharing and then we can get a whole um, screen full of people so it'd be much easier to see who's got their hand up. So, and... How do I stop sharing? Um, you should see a little share screen at the bottom and you should be able to, or just, just touch that, just give it a click and it would stop sharing, hopefully. I can do a new, sh you are screen share, stop share, yeah. Okay. That's it, perfect, thank you. Sorry to interrupt. Should we try um, Catherine uh, Westcott again, see if the- I was wondering if there was any brands we can stay away from. Well, unfortunately, most. <laughs> <laughs> um, they all have their beauties and they all have their problems. Yeah. So frontline certainly is a problem. Um, on the other hand, it does your ticks, it does your fleas, and we know the problems, you know. Imidacloprid is probably the most toxic one. Um, it gets used in certain products that also do lung warm, but I want to say if you're in Herefordshire and you're not going to South Wales all the time, and your dog doesn't eat snails, and doesn't eat food that has been crawled up on by snails, why treat lungworm? You know what I mean? So I think use a slit. I, I would really question the prevention bit. I don't think anything that kills parasites is not toxic. That even with the plants, the, the better it works, the more toxic it is. I would not use any of the plant-based stuff either. So I would really look at risks. I would look at life cycles. I would look at, at, do I need to be doing it and can I test for it? Thank you. I don't know if you can hear me better now. Yes. I can hear you now, yes. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, no. Does that you. answer your question? Yeah, it's just because I have a cat and I've always kind of given her flea treatments. That's why I found this really, really useful. Um, so you're saying kind of just educate yourself on it more. Um, and just find the correct one? Well, the thing is, cats are actually very good at um, catching their own fleas. So you will, if you see fleas on a cat, you have a massive infestation. It's much easier to find the flea bird, yeah? If you're worried, you can have a flea trap, you can turn that on occasionally, you can monitor your house, yeah? Um, a healthy cat sometimes is even able to eliminate a flea infestation by cleaning herself that well. Um, but if, if you have several cats, if there's a high pressure, um, there are certainly situations where you need flea treatments. Um, fleas are much more common in the summer or in the autumn. You see much less trouble in the winter. Maybe do it at the high risk times, you know what I mean? Um, so it's, 
and those products usually well you can buy crappy ones mostly in the supermarkets that don't work at all <laughs> but the ones you buy at the vets are the ones that have this proper toxic stuff in it that you can get online um, they work longer than the interval they're actually advertised for so if you're using it for prevention i would go for longer intervals it also gives the body a bit of a chance to catch up yeah um, but obviously if you if you go for an itch subscription you get the Fipronil once a month, yeah. So you you having absolute maximum cover that'll do you ticks, that'll do you heavy flea loads, yeah. Um, yeah, hmm. Is that what we want? It will also do maximum collateral damage to both family and wildlife. So it's a really really tricky one, and I'm I think those subscriptions should be illegal. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Getting getting fipronil through the post once a month just doesn't feel right to me. Um, Julie North um, has a comment. Uh, Julie, do you want to unmute yourself? Um, yeah, it wasn't so much a comment. It was just a reiteration, really, of what other people had said, which is that it is really um, eye-opening and also quite shocking that it's the same industry in a way because it's you know pet care and animal care and you know I'm sure that most clients who have pets and use these products are the same people who've petitioned against the things that have been killing bees so <laughs> it just feels really shocking and all I was really saying sharing is that the first time I became aware of any of this was last year when a vet locally suggested I treat my, at that point, three dogs, if if I saw fleas, instead of all the time. Oh, that's and, so good to hear. <laughs> yeah, but she was just about to retire. And I'm, you know, she retired early, so she was in her late 50s. But I'm thinking, you know, was that because she felt confident enough to say it? Because yeah, it's really difficult. Is. I'm really scared. I'm yeah. really worried someone's going to have a go at me because I am questioning a business model. So I, I, I feel quite, and now she's left the practice where I still, that I still use and, and I, you know, that's fine, but it's just sort of, it feels like, um, yeah, one of those big brother sort of things, doesn't it? Yeah. And the thing is, yeah, but that I was, quite surprised I, I once put out a Facebook post that I then thought oh I'm I was a bit brave here but like 90% mm -hmm. of the other vets actually agreed with me and one thought said well how dare you saying that the colleague is industry paid well the colleague is industry paid I'm sorry that was just a fact um, so um, I think the awareness is changing you still get your hardcore vets that really believe in it um, and they probably are from a background where they're seeing a lot of very deprived um, clients that very poor hood. It, it is horrible to see really bad infestations, to see puppies or kittens really struggling, to see mm. their households absolutely not getting on top of it and things like that. And those horrifically toxic products. I mean, if I see someone where I know they're not going to do what I'm telling them, and if I put something on or into the animal that's going to work three months, it's going to solve the problem, yeah, when mm -hmm. it comes to fleas. So there are moments where even I use the really bad stuff, mm -hmm. besides the fact that I'm expected to use it, if I'm a local, yeah. yeah. Um, but I will sort of try and gauge the client, and I will sort of try and make clear, look, to really break a cycle, you need those three months. The problem is people think they can do it with pills. You get pills in the supermarkets that work for a day. And as much as I used to hate them, I've started using them because if I know I'm going in a flea-ridden environment with my dog and I use a pill that works a day, that'll keep my dog clean. Yeah, mm. it's absolutely pointless to treat fleas because you'd have to use it for three months. So you're using a lot of them and then they're no longer cheap. Yeah, mm. but if you know those products really well, my problem is that's a product you only get in a supermarket or in a pet shop. They don't know that product that well. They sell it to people who have a flea infestation and it, it's still toxic, but only for 24 hours. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the, the people never get on top of their flea infestation. Yeah. yeah. And then they sign up for Provacto 
four times, you get by four, get, get by three, get the fourth for free if you do it within a year. Yeah, it's just so shocking. I know, I know. <laughs> um, or you get the so many percent off if you have your monthly whatever spot on. Yeah, you. I've done all of that. I've been yeah. sucked in. It, it, well, lots of my friends have, and I sort of think, you do it right for your horse. Why on earth are you doing it differently for your dog? You know yeah. what I mean. Or you're, you're a farmer's wife. You should really know better. It's, it's, become, it's become, we almost class people as good owners that do it. And that's where I feel it goes wrong. Yeah. There mm -hmm. may be, if you're a dog groomer and you have 20 dogs walk through your garden every day, I sort of get your need to do something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But it should really be the exception and not the rule. Mm. anyway great talk thank you very much there is a comment by jenny floyd who is is uh, had her garden um is invaded by her neighbor's cat and she is um wondering about education for cat owners and presumably dog owners but i suppose particularly cat owners who let their cats go roaming well, on a positive note, cats don't tend to go into rivers so much. <laughs> um, I don't know how high, I mean, it would have to be a close contact situation to be a real problem in the garden. So it's probably if, if the cat gets very close to your arms, sort of, yeah. Um, it depends on what product she uses. So you, you may want to just start the conversation. You may just want to say, oh, I've just listen to a talk and it seems that all the parasite treatments have their good and their bad sides what do you use and then you know what I mean she may even say I'm not using anything routinely and that's great and if she says I'm using this or that then you could ask do you know does it get excreted through feces things like that yeah with a cat your bigger problem is probably if it gets the one that goes on the feces and that ends up in your vegetables that's probably what you don't want i think yes, she's and not. that's exactly oh, and, what happens yeah but the, i have a tip for you if you can find a patch where you put some fresh soil and maybe a plant a cat likes like catnip yeah so you make a, a tiny piece of your garden really attractive for the cat valerian catnip bit of loose soil and hopefully the cat will stick to that corner Thank you. It's been a, an eye opener. And thanks for all your tips and for presenting this. It really is important to get that message out there. So thank you again. Very welcome. I'm glad to have found listeners on the topic. There yeah, is. So go on, Amy. Well, I'd really like to see development of the natural and herbal products and um, to understand better how. We can use what is growing in our environment and um, that it's just, it's just not happening as far as I can tell. I think there's a huge space for herbal products, but I think with the parasites, our problem is 95% of the stuff we use doesn't need using. You know what I mean? And I, I would like to state I dislike the herbal ones that are trying to do the same because they do not really work. They seem to work because most of those animals wouldn't have needed treatment. And I do not think you should feed neem, for example, orally. And most of those products are dematomaceous earth. Um, if you inhale that, it's problematic. You know, there's, there's their own risks to it. Um, I don't think we're likely to find a, pro a herbal product that can replace a wormer or a flea treatment. I think we need to be much more intelligent how we handle parasites. We need to make a judgment whether there are actually a problem. If we could only not, tr not pre if we could use the stuff that is there when it's needed, you would have cut out 95% of usage, I dare say. Make it 80, but that's huge. You know what I mean? And I think the herbal warmers, the herbal flea treatments, they're filling the need of people to feel secure. I don't think that they're working. And that's where I'm really uneasy because then, they, then herbal medicine gets a bad name because it doesn't work. So 
um, yeah, research would be good. But a lot of the really toxic stuff originates, I mean, peripherates, they are toxic. You know what I mean? You can, you can get a molecule for a plant and make it really maximum toxic. Um, so um, it's, a, it's a really tricky one. There are organic compounds that are so horrific. So we have to be careful. Yes, you can do research, but I think it's more of, and I mean, watch the batting 60. You know what I mean? There's so much you can do it, that it is no harm. And when it comes to washing detergent, I think there's a there's a point you can you could probably do, really do something there. Um, so, <laughs> but with, when it comes to flea treatments, I haven't got high hopes. I have to admit. Iris, we have lots of more questions. So, mm -hmm. um, David Wittig, do you, you have a question? Yeah, I. I... I was just concerned as to the um, agricultural side of this and how many of these chemicals are used for um, large scale livestock farming. So your farmland is, is contaminated in the same way that would be contaminating. Yeah, um, certainly there is, they are still being used. Um, they are used as purons, they're used as spotons, they're used as, as injections. Um, the neonicotinides mainly, I, I would say. Um, with the wormers, to be fair, the farmers are well ahead of the pet owners. I mean, well ahead. Um, so um, we can learn from both farmers and horse owners when it comes to worming. Um, there is still a bit of a problem with the neonicotinides and obviously you, you, you're looking large quantities. I mean, I hadn't really thought about it coming from livestock feces. It's always been advertised as being coatings on seed. So in in um, growing plants, growing, uh, as you say, sugar beet and... Um, um... Um, I'd really have to look into how it gets excreted, how it's broken down. It wasn't that easy to find that information. Um, you can use it as an injection and you can use it as a spot on. So it definitely goes into the system. Yeah. Um, but they will have, there have been toxicity checks on that. Um, the makers of at least one of them claim they're not a problem with the, with the um, feces of the cows. So it's it's a really but that there are in those products they are tests done, so it it's been through the mill, um, gotcha. and ironically not ironically in my profession we are strongly we would tell any farmer off who treats without testing first who who doesn't prove there's an actual problem, yeah so. Large animal practices, mixed practices, do the, that's the irony. I started out in mixed practice in Herefordshire and I would have told any farmer, bring me a sample, you know, if you want, if you want that of me, I'll want some, you know, skin and hair, um, or I'd want some feces. So we are doing that with the farm animals, where, where, where there are assessments when the products go to be licensed. Um, so there is some knowledge what, what comes out. And um, for vets do discourage, yeah. So, um, and I've seen that happen. I've, I'm, I'd be confident the practices that I've seen that the farm vets were much, much, much better than the small animal vets with regards to being careful about those substances. It's just, just one other thing like that that tends not to come up in this kind of conversation, and that. Um, Pet owners, particularly dog owners, don't really understand how they should be picking up their poo. And I think there's zero awareness that the three that 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 beautiful pill that does three months is in the pool for three months. You know yeah. what I mean? They may be they may be aware the day after or a day after a wormer, but who of them is aware of three months in a row? Yeah, I mean, now I'm a dog owner. And it's a, I, I pick up religiously because having worked my dogs on farmland, I know that if the landowner is going to give me permission, 
the permission will almost certainly be on the grounds that I pick up after my dog. Um, and a, a person walking on a footpath across a far, across farmland shouldn't even be letting their dog off, let alone not picking up after it, because you're that is the, the law. You know, you're not yes, you're not but it's exactly the same in, in cities. Realize. It's exactly the same in cities. You're putting children, there's two options. Either you've got toxic chemicals in your pool and you're putting people at risk, or you haven't got toxic chemicals in your pool and there may be worms in it that you don't want children to get blind from. You know yeah. what I mean? So pool picking should be the done thing. Yeah. Uh, the next question is how do you then dispose of it? And um, um, Yes, because we have, um, Diane Barnard has um brought up the whole question of disposing of poo bags and the biodegradability of both poo and 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 bags. So Diane, do you want to just pop come into this discussion about poo disposal? Yeah. Um, um it, it's not can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not something that I been aware of until somebody bumped into us at the motorway service area who said oh well, you shouldn't be picking up your poo in a bag just leave it there to rot down and uh, he said well I'm in the kennel club and that's what they're now suggesting and I thought when you understand the implication of uh, the problems either of the worms or the um, chemicals I, I think he's unrealistic and I don't know if he is representing the kennel club but I think I should write to them and find out. Yeah, it's a tricky one. I'm pretty sure he isn't representing the Kennel Club. I'm, I'm pretty sure that would have <laughs> that would have had very interesting. I'm, I'm sure responsible citizenship, blah blah. Um, no, I would be very surprised. Um, what's being questioned is the plastic around the poop. So I think biodegradable bags may be a good idea. But then on the other hand, if you have chemicals in there, composting it might not be the most clever idea anyhow. So it's again, it's a yeah, can you do with a, it's a huge problem in areas where you don't want the nutrient, well, it's very nutrient rich dog poo when, once it rots down, which is a huge problem for certain habitats, obviously. So um, yes, untreated poo nature can deal with, but it's a quantity problem. There's just too many dogs. I mean, there's too many sheep. On the hills so it's a really tricky one where do you draw the line you know what i mean so um but the chemicals certainly act an extra layer and i'm absolutely sure my profession is dead against not picking up poo for the both the reason of the phosphates and the reason of the um chemicals that is there is a, a awareness in the veterinary profession that the way we treat animals the poop needs picking. Um, okay. There's um, Nicole de Gruber. Is um, she said she's been talking to envi um, environmental charities who are and how many people are unaware. I just like to bring her in because I think she might have some um, experience in this area. Nicole. Yeah. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I just um, I was actually um, speaking to Iris about this before. Um, I'm just doing my dissertation project on looking at um, finding those chemicals in local ponds because um, we think the issue isn't only in rivers. I know they come through the waste treatment plants and accumulate in urban areas, but um, if I look at the local areas where all our dogs go, a lot of them go into the same ponds over and over again. So. Um, we're actually going to look into that to see if we can find traces of those chemicals where dogs might directly bring them into the water courses, not just in rivers. Yeah, um, and I'm thinking about this. it, ponds are obviously very biodiverse um, places and some of the kind of favourite walking spots could be quite remote ponds that would be otherwise very nice and clean and wouldn't get much other pollution that maybe urban streams would have. So, um, yeah, that's what we'll be looking at just shortly. Yeah, and I think we need to raise that awareness. I think a lot of dog owners may well understand that. Um, and of course, the first sort of two or three days after a spot on has been applied is the biggest, biggest, biggest issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but with the tablets, that is an ongoing issue. Yeah. So that's, 
that's why the tablets are so if they poop next to the pond and then it starts raining <coughs> you'll have the poo in the pond yeah so it's it's a really tricky one I think most most dog owners I've and I've had a dog before, so you know I love dogs. But um, most dog owners I have spoken to, they are completely unaware yeah, that these absolutely. these treatments might actually end up all the way through the body in the fur, in the poo, yeah, but and even the... like it transfers to other pets in the home. Yeah, as well, well it's you... been proven. It's been proven, and if you give a dog something that'll kill ticks for three months, honestly, how do you think that'll work? You know what I mean? Just think about it. Ticks are so difficult to kill. You're giving one tablet and that'll do it for three months. That must be toxic. Mm -hmm. And it is in the bloodstream, full stop. I mean, that's how it works. Yeah. yeah. What I I have to admit, I was a bit surprised that 90% go into the feces unchanged. That seems surreal to me. Yeah. How, how, sort of so little of it actually gets detoxified by the body which may make it a bit nicer for the dog but certainly doesn't make it nicer for the environment yeah so um it's not something i'd want in my garden let me put it that way and the way to keep it safely out of my garden is not to give it to my dog <laughs> simple yeah that's true i mean I, i've spoken to a couple of them and they were recommended that by even the breeders where they got the dog and they were like okay this is the program you sign up to this puppy yeah. puppy package and it's monthly thing and i think people just tend to not think about it at all absolutely not and that's why i hope by going this route over the wildlife trust that i speak to people who are happy to see both sides you know who love their dogs but who are aware of the environment and to avoid the extremes, you know what I mean? Because I think it's lovely to have dogs and it's lovely to have cats. And But if we have lots of them, we need to be responsible with the environment as well. Yeah, definitely. But I think for me, it's also the regulators because if you had a herd of sheep, the, the process of getting that veterinary medicine registered would be entirely different yeah. than if it's spread out dogs because they're saying, oh, it has no impact because you only have one or two dogs. So I think that's why we are trying to prove, well, actually, if 10 dogs come and swim into this pool in this pond, it's still having yeah. an effect. Absolutely. And I mean, the literature, that that's was sort of what they were. I mean, they used a pool, but um, they had 10 dogs in it. And it was quite amazing what amount of chemicals they got out of that. So, yeah, it's, it is a really worrying one. My whippet hates water, so I'm okay on that side. <laughs> Um, another another comment from Eka with a question um, at the end of it. So Eka, do you want to come in here and um, talk about how to approach dog owners? <laughs> uh, I, I did see something flash about fleas and not being able to squash them. I don't know what that was. That was okay. But uh, um, unless Eka wants to come in here, she, she was just asking, um, raising the question of. Um, the defensiveness of pet owners around the um, the use of them, these uh, products and how to... Yeah, uh, but I, I'm saying, yes, those products have their place. And mm -hmm. I'm not expecting anyone to use a flea comb to fight an infestation. Let's be realistic. If you okay. have fleas in your house, if you have three cats covered in fleas, those things are godsend. Yeah, they're amazing. And you do that for three months, you, you have to do your own work, you have to do the hoovering, you have to do the washing, you have to, yeah, otherwise you won't get on top of it, no matter how toxic the stuff, yeah. Um, but after those three months, you should be out of it. And I think that's, and I understand the misery people have been through that had a flea infestation, but it's, it's about understanding how those things work and about reacting correctly at that point. And if we only treated the cats that had fleas, that have fleas, we wouldn't have such a big problem. It's all the ones that are treated that haven't got a problem. Yeah, so. Um, there's a question, um, Vicky McLaughlin um, is, um, can you come in here? I think you were, are suggesting a various uh, herb perhaps, Vicky? Um, she... Hello. Hello, there she is. Hi. Yeah. 
Um, I wondered if you looked at Artemisia vulgaris, I think it is, um, mugwort. Um, I use that for, can well, no, I don't use that. I have learned how to use it for cancer and that's about sort of um, an area where I would consider that and Leishmania possibly. I don't think it's quite a drastic one to use, you know what I mean? And it's one thing if I wanna treat Leishmania or cancer, I think when it comes to ordinary English parasites, it's probably more the Anua actually that does redo Leishmania, Artemisia. I able to use it. I, I personally have not come across anything that really works for a serious infestation. Oh, I tried it on, um, I just put it in some warm um, oil, sunflower oil, and I used it on a pony that had lots of ticks from grazing and um, very wild pasture. Mm, uh, the neem, little tiny neem, ones. Yeah, well, neem and works for ticks to a, to a degree as well. And a pony is probably fairly robust. The problem is, for you can, for example, kill a cat with tea tree oil. So you oh, really, wow. at the point where you're using oils, you have to know what you're doing. Um, with the horses, citronella and things like that can help as well. I would consider that cruel in a cat, you know what I mean. So again, it depends on the species, it depends on, yeah. So it, it's a really, really tricky one. And I've got to look into that. I haven't looked into that for horses. And I think it's much more sensible to, I think a horse won't be as distressed by a smell as a small animal might be. Um, and I myself don't like all essential oils. And I think if you do that to a dog, you know, there are tick treatments for dogs that are essential oil based. I'm not sure whether that's fair. I'm not, besides that, I don't think they work well enough for me to recommend them. Uh, for a dog to have such a strong smell constantly. And latest when it comes to cats, essential oils are dangerous. All yeah. right. Gosh. Um, and I've I've seen I know I know a cat owner who lost his cat to tea tree oil. Wow. Yeah. And he was trying to kill fleas. So that's why I'm saying, and, and cats are quite particular in how they detox things. Their liver works a little bit different. So that's where the problem with the cats comes from. But that's why I'm saying, um, would it be my job to understand what you can do herb-wise? I find it tricky because it's already so difficult. As you say, people are defensive. And if I then, if I then recommend things that reduce stuff by 70%, mm, you know what I mean? Mm, <laughs> those things are out there, but 30% fleas is still pretty annoying, you know? Or um, if you catch a disease from a tick, mm, yeah, it's, it's, again, it's, it's very localized. Um, I, I have a friend in Bristol who had Borrelia. So I'm very grateful we have so few ticks and we're not in Bristol. There seems to be quite a hot spot for Borreliosis and for Lyme's disease in Bristol. Um, so it's, it's that fine line and I'm probably too much of that to be prepared to take the risk. You know what I mean? And um, I know how, how well a dog smells, how, how well the nose of a dog works. And it just seems offensive to me to use such strong spelling products. And a lot of them I use daily. Ooh, I don't know, you know what I mean? Thank you very much, right. <laughs> um, we have a question from Philip Griffith. Are you there, Philip? About transmission from dogs wandering where sheep are grazing. Uh, Philip Griffith. Hello there. Yeah, Hi. I managed to find the mute button. Good. Um, just, just as a farmer, we're, we're always told um, to check that um, people using footpaths um, make sure their dogs are cleaned or have been wormed for the sake of, I forget what parasite, but sheep pick it up and it gets into the, the brain. Is that a myth or is it a reality? Well, it is a reality, but the dog has to have eaten sheep offal. So the problem is usually, to be honest, the farm dog. 
Yeah, because your city dog that comes at the weekend is not really like, well, other than you walk in an area where there's dead sheep lying around and you let your dog eat the um, liver or the lungs of a sheep and then come back a month later. And then, the, you know, that's, it is absolutely real. It is something that's very dangerous for farmers. We see it in, and it's why mixed practices tell farmers to worm that the, the, the worm takes 32 days. And that's why the farmer should be worming once a month. And I sort of think, wait a second, that's two days short. <laughs> it's a really tricky one. And um, if your dog regularly eats fresh sheep offal, I would say, well, maybe yes, you need to either check or worm very frequently. Um, but the problem is probably in that case, not so much the townie coming mm. for a walk. Um, it gets more problematic with the raw feeding people, and I would very strongly advise they should really be freezing the stuff for two weeks. That really works, but and it probably doesn't take two weeks, but that's safe, yeah. Um, and it doesn't happen even with the commercial raw food, and there I wouldn't be so sure that there isn't a potential problem. So the question is, what sort of Everybody should be poop picking, poop picking anyhow, and then the problem is sorted. You know what I mean? Um, but it's not an easy one, and the biggest risk in that setting is the farm dog that mm -hmm. has access to a carcass or yeah. the hunt, probably. You know, that would be one I would worry about. Okay, taking it to the extreme, then, how about foxes? Um, uh, with, with dead animals around, not that you see many dead animals around, but. Most of the worms like their host. So with the foxes, I have a problem that the, their lung worm seems to go on to, um, goes on to dogs as well. But very lucky we do not have the fox tape worm. I have that, we have that in Germany and that's the reason I do, uh, I have to, you have to, if you come from the continent to England, you have to tape worm treat for tapeworms and I think that's a sensible thing because you do not want fox tapeworm over here which is worse than the one you get from sheep yeah the one you get from sheep is the one that makes the farmers ill as well but it's not quite as bad as the one that goes between foxes and so um foxes are a problem with regards to the not so dangerous lung worm um I am you can you can get worms from eating frogs as a dog you know you can get all sorts of funky <laughs> things um I've, I've had that in my dog once they look really funny but i felt a bit bad that my dog must have eaten a frog but hey ho um so it, it depends yeah the the cats get the worms from eating most of the tape worms from eating mice so it, it's understanding those cycles and it's understanding the way the dog eats and the way yeah things are passed on um mm. The problem is when you're giving a worming pill, you're not even preventing. So you give your tape wormer and if the dog eats sheep lung the next day or sheep liver um, and catches the worm, you have the problem 32 days later. Yes. Yeah. So does that mean we should be worming every 32 days? Tricky one. A, a wormer works has a similar effect onto the guts as an antibiotic. I wasn't aware of that. I did not learn that at a vet school. I was very shocked to learn that from someone who does a lot of sort of microbiome stuff. Um, and I believe her. Um, and I think doing that when it's needed is not an issue. And I don't see lots of bad dogs who get diarrhea from wormers, but they are the exception. But if we are treating our dogs once a month with a wormer, <laughs> besides the fact that I'm very surprised we've not had, we don't have, it seem to have any resistance problems. Um, yeah, it's, and I get to see all those people who haven't wormed in five years and, and feed raw, and maybe one in 10 samples come back, comes back positive. And I sort of pick people out and I say, your dog looks bad, I'd use a wormer or do a worm count, you know? Um, so you sort of look at a dog and you sort of, as a vet, you sort of think either it's fed a very cheap kibble or it's got worms. Yeah. So um, I, I, I do see farm dogs and um, make sure that my dog stays clear. 
you know what I mean. So um, it's certainly farming communities, farming dogs, farm dogs are a bit of an extra cup of tea. But um, yeah, it's about that sort of, yeah. Um, I think Thank we're going to have two more um, people good. come in and then I think we're going to have to wrap it because we're getting close to our closing time. So um, Sarah Windrum, can you, you've put in a couple of comments. Can you come in here? Yeah, hi. Um, no, the first comment was just that I've seen that flick your dog poo um, up, on a, up on a notice in a wood. The one that somebody mentioned that flick it and don't bin it surprised me. So it's okay. Um, the other one, I was just asking my, my cat, squash, I do squash the fleas. I comb and squash when I see them, if I can. I get, and she doesn't get, she's not too bad on fleas. So often that works, but um, I wouldn't dream of just giving spot ons all the time. I, I'll use a spot on if that's, if that's not keeping it down. Um, and I see tapeworms and I use something. So I use Advocate and um, Johnset spot ons. But does that sound all right to you or would you recommend something else? Um, those are ones that work. It covers your, the Advocate obviously cover. Did you say Advocate or did you say Advantage? I think I said Advocate, that's what I meant. Yeah, Advocate does do fleas and roundworms. Yeah. Um, it does contain the bee toxic one, but I think I think when you really see fleas on your cat, you have good reason to use three applicates in a row even. Um, more effective than squ squashing the fleas will be trying to wash the bedding, trying to hoover a lot. Make sure you, if you have a hoover bag that you get rid of that, they will breed in the hoover bag. Um, mm -hmm. So the problem is more in the environment than in the cat. But if your cat has a habit of going somewhere where there's a lot of fleas, that can be a problem. Um, and yeah, the products you are using, they match. You're not doubling up, which is a good one. A lot of even veterinary prescribed stuff, they use, they use the, adv the advocate and then they use Dronto and that doubles up on the round worms, which is unnecessary. So you're doing flea and round worm in the spot on and you're doing um, tape worm in another spot on or in a tablet, either forms. Um, and the things can be linked. You can get fleas from uh, worms from flea by eating fleas. So it makes perfect sense. Mice are a big problem in, in the cats. So yes, if you see fleas, I'd go for three months and then I would try without again. And maybe get your flea lamp. That'll get you the warning earlier. It's a what? Flea lamp? Did you flea say? lamp. It's it's got. Um, you only switch it on occasionally. It's got sticky tape underneath, and it makes it warm. And then the fleas jump on that and get trapped. And the idea is not to kill the fleas. The idea is that you get a warning quite early because they're breeding in your house. So you have to one flea you see on the cat. You have quite a few thousand in the house. Thank you. Okay. Um. Becca Morgan has been patiently waiting to say. Becca, are you there? If I said your name correctly, I think you've managed to unmute. Are you there? Yes, you can pose your question. Are you still there? I think she's uh, maybe sorting out a microphone issue and Julian yep. Selman's here yep. with a question. Um, yeah, no, she, she did say, <laughs> yeah, she thought she'd unmuted. In the meantime, Julian, yes, sorry. Uh, sorry to ask two questions, but I find this so interesting. Um, I think, yeah, you're absolutely right to emphasize that we've got, we've all got a responsibility in this, but it's just striking me as, as you're talking that you're an unusual vet in raising this. And I, uh, you're probably putting your head above the parapet and I respect that entirely, but the biggest problem, it strikes me, is the advice we're getting from vets. So um, you, you're mentioning that this is this is beginning to be discussed um, amongst vets. Um, how I mean, do you think that that this could gain some momentum amongst the veterinary community to change the way that advice is given to your clients? Because 
if, if we could change that, then we can really start to resolve things. I'm not attacking you and your profession. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> it's gaining, it's definitely gaining momentum. There's a um, one of the authors of the paper that um, with the 20 rivers is actually giving a lecture at a veterinary conference on the 11th of May, tackling the topic. Um, the guidelines of the British Veterinary Association, which is not some sort of, you know, they have a lot of opinions I don't agree with. Um, they are quite, you know, mainstream on average, but their recommendations are decent. They're, they're saying practice shouldn't be offering, offering those pet clubs. Yeah, that, and I think it must be the, the author of that article that has got quite a strong influence, let's face it. Mm. I'm very grateful to him. Um, I, um, so it, it's coming, it, it is coming. Um, I, the majority of the sold products are still the over-the-counter ones. That's in tons, and we're talking tons, yeah. The fipronil and the imidacloprid, which imidacloprid is a, you can get it either way, but we're not selling it that much more that that much anymore in the practices. So it, that's mostly over the counter. Um, so I think those two things need tackling, and the supermarket, the pets at home, the pet shops, the each web page. Those are as at least as big a player. Yes, we as vets, we have the moral responsibility to make people understand, and I think mm. we we have the or we should have the knowledge of the parasites to sort of minimize the collateral damage and maximize the effectiveness of treatments. And I think that's what we need to understand. We should be selling our knowledge and not just a chemical because it's, and the, but my problem is selling the tests is so expensive. How am I gonna justify that to my clients? Yeah, I'm, I'm struggling to find a lab that gives me a price. You can do it online, but then I don't like the way they do the tapeworms. Yeah, but if, if someone wants to be doing, I mean, obviously I offer it, but if someone wants to be doing it online, just do the pool sample anyhow and go with the online one, I can't beat the price, you know? Um, but even the people that come to me, they, they come across fleas the first time and they will be signing up for a pet club forever. And you said, and they use, two, they use something from the pet shop and from the vet at the same time. And I just think, yeah, we've just been discussing fecal accounts and things like that. And you see the first flea and you, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it is about, um, the profession is slowly getting there. I think we need to put our foot down and need to say, look, this can't be right. I have a think, do you really think selling me this every three months or every month can be right? Um, and, and linking it to a discount on the consult, you know, we're sort of branding those pet owners, the best pet owners. That's what really bugs me. Yeah, that you can only get the percent discount on the consults if you also take the flea treatment once a month. It's like, what? <laughs> so that's where I find it really critical. And I, as I said, I hope my profession is not gonna have me for it. Though my one of the professional bodies says I should have the freedom to advise <laughs> and there shouldn't be a practice policy. But for me, it's really a problem. I feel there's a lot of practices I wouldn't want to work for. The corporates even judge their branches by how much of those subscription things they do. Terrible. Well, thank you very much for your answer. Eka, I mean, Iris, just a very, <laughs> Eka has asked you, this mm -hmm. is one last thing, um, a one-liner for her to say to pet owners who, um, she, who, um, what is it? What is she? I say? think is mine working now. Yes, it is. Oh. There you go. Um, yes, sorry. Thank you so much, Iris, again for starting this campaign. Um, I first heard about it by Dave Goulson, the bee expert, and um, I do this podcast called the Ashland Forest Podcast, and we're having him on. And we've talked about this in the podcast, the last episode. And every pet owner I've mentioned this to, first of all, they say proudly that they're, their first thing is I'm to say proudly that they're treating their pet. You know, they, that's, as you said earlier, that's a point of honour. But there is a defensiveness and they then people seem to say, oh, but it's so painful for them. And I just think 60 million bees, we're talking about the toxicity of 60 million bees. So I just want to be able to say a one liner that doesn't alienate people, because I think it's so easy for people to feel, you know, a way of calling in people rather than calling out. Because the minute you call out people, mm. you know, mm. uh, well, 
I think it needs to be safe for the pet and the family as well. And I think not even that is guaranteed. We're talking chemicals. I mean, we thought DDT is not a problem. We thought so many things aren't a problem. And we know fipronil, for example, ca can cause depression. Yeah. yeah. So, well, no, that, that's overstating it. But yeah, so it's, it's such a broad line. And I focus on the environmental bit. But if I was talking... If you were in the Wildlife Trust, I would have given you very scary things on what it does with, you know, the body has to break it down. The body has to live with it. We're, we're, yeah, we are exposing our animal for the animal lover. Look into how the stuff actually works in your animal and what potential side effects are there. And if you're saying three months, you know, it, it, you really the dog, if you have got to treat the dog, they've got to be on the lead for three months or more. It, it's like that's too big an ask, isn't it? It is. Absolutely. And um, the problem is we haven't got the data for that one. Yeah. But we know the product goes in the poop. We know the product is toxic when it gets used for red mites in chicken how toxic the poop it's probably mostly the problem for the dung beetle yeah that's but then what if it gets washed into the pond and the pond you know stays there how does it degrade in water it, it's proven to stay in soil or we know it stays in soil for a long time i i personally i have a big problem with the three month one it's it's not one i personally i feel very bad if i have to give that out right uh, and, and, and lastly, just very quickly, so I live in Sussex. And, and, and when it comes to dog owners, um, dogs can fit from it quite spectacular. <laughs> dogs can, so, sorry? Epileptic fits. I have an epileptic fit. Um, mm. Just, do you think there are vets like you in each of the counties? That I, I, I don't know if you're prepared to give a talk for Sussex Wildlife Trust or... I can probably find you someone for Sussex. <laughs> oh, that would be great. I don't know if you could send me that VAR... Yeah. Um, so tell me where you are you on the Ashdown Forest. Perfect. I have looked there. There's an amazing holistic vet down there. Oh, brilliant. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you want to tell me their name now? So I don't want to take up the meeting. <laughs> um, Birgit Alemeyer. Birgit Holistic Vet. I, I couldn't quite hear that. Birgit? Oh, yeah. Um, I can, and if you um, Google Birgit Holistic Vet, you'll find her. She's moved a bit, but she actually lives in Forest Row. Her practice is in Ken, it's just over the border now, but she lives in Forest Row. I live in Forest Row myself, so. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I think I know the name, actually. Thank, yeah. thank you so much. Yeah, no, this definitely needs to be told more widely. Yeah, and there are a few of us, but there aren't very many. <laughs> okay. Thank you again. Very welcome. Oh, there's a great like, one. There's a, if anyone needs someone in Glasgow, I definitely know someone in Glasgow and Chipping Norton. <laughs> okay. I'd like to say thank you very much on behalf of the Herefordshire Wildlife Trust City Branch. And uh, now that we've saved you an absolute fortune on preventative medicines for your dogs, please don't think twice about donating to us. Thank you very much. <laughs>